and good evening. I'd like to welcome you all to the April 24, 2014 regular monthly meeting of the Scarborough Sanitary District. We'll start off with roll call. Dave Nelson. Here. Charlie Anderson. Here. Nick Rico is not present. Ben Viola. Here. Rob McSorley is also not present. Seth Garrison. Here. And I am Jason Greenleaf. Order of business approval of the March 27, 2014 regular monthly meeting minutes. Motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Motion. Second. Second. Any errors or omissions? I found on page 10 um, down where we were making the motion. And then we were approving the motion that said, you know, we, we changed the motion. We actually amended the motion. Mm -hmm. But then it says the original motion to approve uh, passed five, one absent, uh, abstention. But it would be the amended motion was approved, right? You are correct. Abstentation. Mr. McSorley. <coughs> by the trustees. Five, zero, Amend the yep. to amend the motion. Okay. Gotcha. Are you good with that, Wendy? Yeah, okay. Perfect. Anything else? None. All in favor of approval? None opposed. Next order of business is the superintendent and operations report. Dave. Okay. Um, a copy of the monthly report of operations for the month of uh, March is included in your packet. Our effluent quality was well within our permitted limits for all parameters. We achieved 93 and 94% removal for both BOD and TSS, and the average effluent concentrations for those parameters were 13 milligrams per liter each. A copy of the pump station flows for the month of March is also included in your packet. As you can see, our flows were up with the Peak influent flow of uh, 3 million gallons per day. Uh, we averaged typically about 1.2. We had four stations with high peaking factors for that month, uh, Dunstan Road, um, Higgins Beach, Black Point Road, and Libby Road. Our collection crew is looking into potential sources of the, the inflow. As noted in correspondence below, we had a broken sewer service at Higgins Beach that was the cause of the high flows there. Last summer, we did address a significant inflow source at the Libby Road pump station, which we found during the springtime similar event. The pile test uh, for the sludge pump uh, has been a success. We have placed the order for the second Penn Valley pump. Carl Tucker and Paul Cobb have uh, removed one of the hose pumps in preparation of the permanent install of the Penn Valley pump. Once the sec second pump is received, that install will begin. The, uh, the aeration valve actuators are on order, and they should be in, in about two months. And again, Paul and Carl will be installing these units once they arrive. The 2013 um, Maine Rural Water Association sewer rate survey has been completed and published. I have condensed this information specific to the sewer system for the greater Portland area and have included a copy of this information in your packet. A complete document can be found on Maine World Water's web website. The uh, residential annual sewer rates for the greater Portland area range from $873 per year to $357 per year, with an average of $556 per year. The district's annual residential rate is $396 per year. Uh, for comparison, I, I will be posting this information on our website with a link to the original <coughs> document. We are cu currently conducting two pilot tests at two pump stations, utilizing two different technologies for testing um, grease removal. Uh, the first is being done at the Gorham Road pump station, used as an enzyme block. This test has not been successful and will likely not continue once the enzyme is used up. The second test is taking place at the Evergreen Farm pump station utilizing a mechanical aerator slash digester called the Little John Digester, um, and, um, which we were able to borrow from Falmouth uh, Wastewater Treatment Facility. Uh, currently, it, it's really performing quite well, and uh, we actually recently shut it off to see how the grease 
regenerates, and we're going to relocate it to another station and test it there. We are also conducting a pilot testing uh, for a replacement of our polymer feed systems for our sludge dewatering operations, um, which are approaching the end of their useful life. Uh, Prominent has provided a demo unit, which uh, we will first use on our gravity belt thickness and then on a sludge presses. Okay. On Hagus Parkway in at, uh, the gravity sewer at the intersection with Payne <coughs> Road, there's a 150-foot 150, 150 section of gravity sewer that was core board under Hagus Parkway when that sewer was installed as part of that sewer project. Um, this section of sewer has been identified as a problem area due to a dip in the line and requires regular cleaning. Our, re our most recent check of the line found a substantial amount of grease that required an extensive amount of cleaning um, of, the, of the system. It, right after the dip in the line is also a flat spot in the line where the, the pipe literally has uh, um, essentially zero slope, so it really exacerbates the problem. Um, uh, we'll be increasing our inspection of this area uh, much more and with increase in, in cleaning. The problem with the, that we're having with the line is that it's a 15-inch line, and our jetter is um, it's really at its wit's end to address that size line and the, uh, the, with the dip in the line. It may be something that we might have to um, contract out to a Ted Berry firm to actually yeah, Ted Berry firm, similar to Ted Berry, um, to do a sufficient cleaning on it. But we'll, we'll be keeping an eye on it. Uh, at the main DOT, we'll be replacing the Pine Point Bridge by Snow's Canning early in 2015. Uh, sewer and forest mains run within the right of way, but goes under the railroad tracks uh, that the bridge crosses over. As part of this bridge replacement, they need to install a retaining wall, which may be in conflict of our sewer and force main, depending on the final design. Uh, we may be required to move our infrastructure within this area. Uh, I'll keep you posted as that further develops. Uh, we have hired Francine Libby for the, the, the clerk position that uh, opened up when Dick Landry retired. Francine has started. She started this past Tuesday. Um, during the advertising process, we had a total of 32 applicants, of which we interviewed seven, and Francine was the clear um, person to select for that job. And finally, um, in the last residential billing uh, that was sent out, there was a, a flyer including that, uh, included within that uh, to address baby wipes, reminding um, homeowners not to flush those uh, down uh, the sewer. So and with that, I conclude my report. Mm -hmm. Questions for the superintendent? No? All right. Moving on to correspondence, Meyer Development Solutions, <coughs> 25 Vesper Street. The house sewer at uh, 25 Vesper Street was broken during some ongoing construction activities that was being coordinated by De Meyer Development Solutions. This had been brought to the attention of the uh, contractors by Howard Littlefield, and they were instructed, n number one, to cap the sewer service, and two, to take out a sewer permit um, and, uh, while, the, while the work is being done. Neither of these items were completed prior to March 30th. On March 30th, during the heavy rains, the broken sewer service allowed stormwater, which I estimated at approximately 85,000 gallons, uh, to enter into our sewer system, which then overwhelmed our pump station at Higgins Beach, causing the station to go into a high water alarm. Fortunately, our standby pump was able to handle the additional amount of flow due to the stormwater, thus preventing any sewer, sanitary sewer overflows. Attached is a copy of a letter that further details this event uh, that I sent off to uh, Myers Development um, Solution. And as a result of these activities, I sent Myers Development Solution an invoice of $2,057.40 to cover our additional cost of operation as a result of that in, uh, inflow. Any questions or comments on the correspondence? We heard of a reply from 
they haven't replied with regards to the, um, the invoice, but they have been in and pulled their permit. Is there a final inspection certificate that we have to issue associated with that permit? That yes, the, this, the, the permit that they took out is for capping the sewer. They're going to have to pull another permit uh, to reconnect because now the, the, sewer, the sewer is actually completely disconnected connected from the house. The foundation has, had been removed. So I'm assuming this is a big remodeling replacement yep. Yep. job there. Exactly. It would be nice to get paid as part of the uh, permit approvals for this before occupancy permits are granted to the actual owner of the property. Yeah, I, I've already communicated with the, um, the town's code enforcement officers. I've actually gave them a copy of the letter for two reasons. For that reason, number one, to make sure um, the house, uh, that they're aware of the situation and, and that we do get paid prior to the occupancy permit. And two, to just uh, as an educational <coughs> item to show them how significant, you know, it is for one of these sewer services to go underwater. It could have been much worse, actually. Well, I just think it would be difficult to chase after them after, after, the, the, fact. after the project yep. is concluded, and, uh, and we should probably withhold the issuance of the okay on the final approval of the sewer work until we have payment of the Absolutely. ones that they owe. Any other comments? We'll move on to old business. First item is Sawgrass Subdivision off of Sawyer Road. On behalf of Star Homes, uh, BH2M is uh, requesting district approval for approximately a 2,175 foot sewer extension and to connect uh, to the sewer 23 single family homes and the proposed Sawgrass Subdivision of Sawyer Road. As described in the attached letters, dated March 13th and April 21st, and the plans dated August 2013, most recently revised April 21st. The subdivision would be serviced by a low-pressure sewer system in accordance to the district policies and discharge into an existing six-inch force main on Sewer Road. This item got tabled during the last meeting with the request to review the option of tying into the existing six-inch force main, uh, which they have done and the calculations are attached, and uh, it, it, it's a very feasible option. I recommend their approval with the following conditions. The project is within the original sewer service area. The original lot had an allocation for one residential dwelling unit. With that, each of the remaining 22 single-family homes is subject to the capacity reserve fee. The capacity reserve fee is based on a single-family residential unit uh, without accessory units. Any additional homes or accessory units in excess of this are subject to additional approvals and capacity reserve fees. The current capacity reserve fee uh, per home is 28 34 and 36 cents. This is adjusted monthly based on the ENR, construction cost index. Based on the current ENR, the total capacity reserve fee for the 22 homes is $62,355.89, which is due prior to issuance of the sewer extension permit. Uh, the clean-out manhole shall be Schedule 80. Ball valves shall be True Union 2000. Industrial ball valves are equal. Uh, coupling shall be female pro propylene cam lever, and, um, including a female plug coupling as manufactured by Banjo. Man manholes covered shall be district standard manholes. All sewer pipes shall be SDR 11 pipe and shall be green. All force mains, including home services, shall have detectable underground utility marking tape placed approximately three feet below grade, directly above the force main. Uh, on the six-inch tap to the um, existing force main, utilize an, a tapping sleeve and valve installed by trained service technicians. Uh, the positive displacement pumps and building laterals, which are installed as part of the low-pressure sewer system, shall be purchased, owned, and operated by the property owner. The recorded subdivision shall include the following note, sewer services by means of a pressure sewer system, and each building lot is served by an individual pumping system owned and operated and maintained by the homeowner. Owners and occupants of premises serviced by the pressure sewer 
systems shall expressly release the Scarborough Sanitary District from any and all liabilities associated with the use and operation or malfunction of the pressure sewer system. Final plan signed and stamped by a licensed professional engineer submitted to the superintendent prior to issuance of the permits. Sewer extension permit is required. A complete application associated fee shall be submitted to the district prior to any sewer extension work. Sewer permit is required for each house. A complete application associated fee shall be submitted to the district at the time of per, uh, permit is executed. Prior to the permit being executed, no site work shall be completed, uh, site sewer work. Installation of the sewer service inspected by and approved by the district. And finally, the, uh, professional surveyed electronic geo-reference CAD drawings, a stamped PDF of the CAD drawing, and a stamped paper copy can be submitted to the district upon completion of the project. I should note that there is a representative from the engineering firm that is here uh, to answer any questions. That you Motion have. to approve, Mr. Chairman, with a caveat attached by the superintendent. Second. Motion and a second. Any questions? Uh, I have one question. Um, when we perform the inspection, uh, do we inspect the completed um, connection or do we witness the entire installation process? How, how do the inspections usually occur? Um, it be little of both. Um, we try to be there for the entire installation process. That's not always um, practical. Um, we, we certainly inspect it before it gets through the entire thing before it gets covered up. So we may not be there for the actual beginning of the trench or the install, you know, the laying of the pipe will, will be there, inspect it before it gets covered up. And my only concern is, you know, tapping up a force main. Oh, we would be yeah. there for that. Okay. <laughs> Charlie? Yeah, uh, I think my question is with regard to um, item six, the, uh, the note that's required for um, the property owners releasing the district from all liabilities associated with the use of the pressure sewer system. Uh, the mechanism for that release, the recording of it, and the release being uh, defined on heirs and the signs to that property and the proper disclosure and awareness of that being documented and part of the chain of title for those properties is really important, I think. What, what's the mechanism going to be to accomplish that release? Well, we were, the, uh, the, uh, the intent was just to have it on the, um, the recorded uh, subdivision plan. Um, but we can do more than that. We can get with council and get some advice from our council on that. Yeah, well, I think it's important. I mean, I, frankly, I'm uncomfortable with these kind of systems on a, as a private system. I, I had a fairly high level of comfort with them when we, when we decided that we would accept them as public systems also. I was much less comfortable with that, but the, but the, requirement for the release, mm -hmm. um, I think kind of assuaged my concerns a little bit for mm -hmm. this type of a system. And I think it does provide flexibility for uh, property owners and developers to be able to utilize and access our system. But um, to me, <coughs> once, the, once the subdivision plan becomes sort of an old document, mm -hmm. Uh, what we find, I think we'll find, is people coming to us after the fact, pleading it, ignorance, I didn't, I didn't know, I wasn't aware, looking to us as the public utility for um, providing satisfaction for grievances that they might have about the operation of the system. And so I think some, some sort of document um, would be an important tool for us to have, and that would be uh, bringing something consciously to people's attention when they're buying property other than a note on the plan, which people frequently will come to us and say, oh, gee, I never read the subdivision of the plan before it closed. You know? So I would urge us to 
try to find a formal document that we could require to be um, executed to fulfill this note on the plan. Because the note on the plan just says, um, the actual wording is, you know, that they shall expressly release the sanitary district. And I don't know if that note on the plan binds the individual who is the owner of, mm -hmm. of the lot. So what I expect is these lots will be built by an owner-builder who will not be a resident there but sell them to, uh, you know, a, a buyer who's going to reside there. And then when the problem comes three years down the road or whatever, it's going to be a shock to folks. So I just want us to be covered. I think we only had one problem with that, which wasn't even ours. It was on Fairway Drive mm -hmm. quite a few years ago. That system's entirely private. Yeah. I had sort of a related question. Um, you know, what, in, in your opinion, is the, the expected useful life of the positive displacement pumps, and are there fail safes when they fail to protect the, the homeowner? Well, um, the expected life is probably, uh, I, I just read an article on, um, is typically around uh, 12 to 15 years. Um, and actually maybe even a little longer than that. Uh, the systems uh, have a check, a, a check valve right at the property line plus the shutoff. Uh, they also have an internal check valve within the pump station itself and the, uh, the positive displacement pump itself actually acts as a check valve. So in essence, there's three redundant, you know, three so redundant really check valves. really very little chance of backflow yeah. into the house if there's a pump failure. You mean to have several stages of failures in order to have that be a problem. And I assume this is probably a $1,000 roughly unit for positive displacement pump or, or more or less? No, the units themselves actually um, I, I believe the, uh, there's a project going on right now in um, off Tenney Lane, and I believe the contractor's uh, price for the units is $3,800 a piece, not installed. That's just delivered to the site. <coughs> Which is the tank, the control system, pumps, et cetera. Yeah, the tank, the pump, the control system. Any additional questions? Um, I guess I, I guess I just offer an amendment to the motion to include the provision for the superintendent to work with uh, legal counsel to come up with an appropriate form uh, to put in place for the implementation of the of the note for the release. So do we amend our motion? We would need to amend that motion, I believe. I'll amend the motion by that. Okay. I just one other question too that I was thinking of. Is there a disclosure if one of those houses are sold that it's a low pressure sore that the new owner would be aware of that? That's essentially what Charlie's talking yeah. about. Yeah, that's what I that's what I'm trying to do is get something yeah. introduced in the chain of custody that would make a property a buyer, a future buyer aware of this. I mean, in theory the note on the subdivision plan should put them on notice, but right. I've had many, many people over the years never lay eyes on the subdivision plan or have it in pa a pile of paperwork that they never never went through prior to purchasing property. I just had a repeat question I think from last month was that we own to the shutoff and, and that's it. It's to the property line. Pro shutoff or pro property line? It's, it's they shut off that the property line, so to the shut off. Just one quick comment, not a question. I, I did want to extend the thanks out to BH2M with uh, you know their efforts here to take our suggestions into advisement and uh, kind of go back to the drawing board with us. So we thank you very much for for all the work you did there. But, uh, with that, um, did we have a motion for the amendment? Yes. You did in a second. Yes. Oh. Okay. Dave and Ben. Okay. All in favor of approval? Not opposed. All right. Thank you, Randy. Mr. Chairman, a new business. Uh,
Do we have a second session for the year prior to the annual audit report? I think maybe we should switch those around. Are you okay with that? Did you communicate that? I'm fine. Okay. I'm fine with that. Anybody else have any issue with changing that? Do we need a motion for that? I think we do. Yeah, I think we do to amend the agenda. So I'll entertain a motion. You've made a motion? You consider that a motion? Okay. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor of amending? None opposed. So we'll move on to, under new business, the item B, which is the 2013 annual audit and annual report. Okay. Um, uh, Willette and Associates has completed uh, the 2013 annual audit of the district financial statement, a copy of which um, was included, uh, sent out to you earlier than the packet was sent out, and then I also included an electronic copy in the packet. No significant issues or findings were uh, identified. Um, Mike Dunn from Willette Associates is here to make a presentation with regard to the audit, and uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Dunn. Yeah, okay, you can the take the podium there, or you can have my seat if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I give her an update. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank thank you for asking me to come here tonight. Um, I think I've been auditing Scarborough Sanitary for it's got to be close to 20 years now. Um, I was with uh, with Mac Page, McDonald Page and company for the first 20 years of my uh, my professional career, and then uh, about a year and a half ago, I opted to move my practice to Willett Associates. Um, and uh, so, but you know, doing doing these sewer and water districts has been a niche. I've been doing them since I since I graduated from college. Um, and I've, I've, you know, Scarborough Sanitary has been something that's, it's nice to put a kind of a name to a face now that I've been doing it for so long and reading on <coughs> the minutes for many years. But um, I hope everybody, everybody should have a copy of the financial statement um, that was released. And I, I do also, uh, we do release a letter, uh, a Board of Trustees letter. Hopefully everybody has a copy of that. I'll be going through that. And I provided everybody with a PowerPoint presentation, um, kind of used in conjunction. Certainly, if you have any questions as we go through this, by all means, in interrupt me. Um, and so we can discuss it as we go. I'm, more familiar, I'm very familiar with doing, you know, kind of going through in that motion to go through the financials. But uh, just kind of on the first slide, I, I always start my presentations with this. Is just a kind of an overview of what an audit is. Um, I know many of you are probably familiar with what an audit is, but this just kind of gives a couple bullet points to that. Um, you know, really what, what we are as a, as a CPA firm coming in and performing an audit is we're a, a third party independent, um, you know, firm reviewing management's financial statements and providing an opinion on that. And, you know, I think in many cases, not only with water and sewer districts, but with businesses when we perform audits, uh, what that does is when we put our opinion on those financial statements, it, it provides assurance to readers. So when people pick up the financials and read them, it provides them with an assurance that what they're reading is accurate because we're, we're independent of management. Um, in performing those procedures on the financials. A couple other things that we do that may not, you may not be aware of, um, you know, as part of performing an audit, we review internal controls that management has over financial reporting. Um, certainly, if we have suggestions to improve those, we will give those to management. Um, you know, and, and certainly if we find some deficiencies, we, we again would would notify management of that too and, and possible some recommendations. So um, the other thing is, you know, with with especially water and sewer districts, 
Um, they're subject to Governmental Accounting Standards Board or Government Accounting Standards when they're preparing their financials. Um, as you may or may not know, as you know, accountants, we like to change our standards all the time, and you know, just to make it difficult for a lot of districts. But no, it's really to, to prepare financials that are you know more useful to readers to make them better understand it. But anytime any of those new standards come up, we're we're there also to help management implement those to make sure you you're following the appropriate standards on that. So you know that's kind of in a nutshell what we do as part of the audit. Even though it happens once a year, um, certainly we receive calls during the year if there are any questions, any unusual, any unusual items. So I just wanted to bring that forward to the to the trustees. So on the next slide, the first thing I'd like to go over is that trustee letter. Um, this is a kind of an important letter. It's standard. You receive one every year. And it's been it's been a standard document for a number of years, um, and basically what it does is it it's a communication between the CPA firm and the trustees directly, not in between management. So it's our communication to you um, to go basically through what we were engaged to do, which is to audit the financials, um, and it covers a number of different bullet points which are in bold on the, the pages of the letter. And just I've kind of summarized those in the slide just to kind of go through them real quickly. Um, the first area, qualitative aspects on accounting practices. This, this identifies um, certain, again, new policies, new standards that have come, that, that are effective in the current year. Also, if there are any estimates or significant disclosures when you're reading the financials that you should be aware of, if any of those come up, we're going to identify them in this letter so we communicate them directly to you. So the first paragraph talks about standards and policies, and the communication is there were, there were no new changes this year. So what that means when you're reading the financials is that when you're looking at the numbers from last year and you're comparing them to this year, there has been no changes in the policy there. So um, what you're looking at, there has, no, there has been no significant changes in, in how the, that accounting and how that financial reporting has happened. Um, the second paragraph talks about estimates. Your financial statements do contain estimates. Um, there certainly could be an estimate when it comes to your accounts receivable and the valuation. If there are some accounts receivables that aren't, aren't deemed collectible, that would reduce your, your valuation of those and you would have an allowance. Um, currently, the, the accounts receivable that you have on your financials, are, uh, the management has deemed all of those fully collectible. Um, with the district having the possibility of leaning the property, they probably would be collectible, so there's no allowance for that. So we don't consider that a significant estimate, but one significant estimate you're going to see in your financials is depreciation, and I'm sure you're all well aware of that. Um, certainly the structures, um, the building, the equipment, um, that's all purchased in one year, but expensed over basically esti uh, management's estimate of the useful life of that property. So although you, your cash flow, your cash goes out one year, that depreciation goes over a number of years. Um, and that's an estimate. That's, you're estimating how long that, that asset's going to live over, over its useful life. So and it's pretty significant. That number is a significant dollar amount in your financials. It's not actually cash. It's, it's an estimate cash paid in prior years and what's being expensed in the current year. So we think that's a significant estimate, so we're going to bring that to your attention here in this letter. As it comes to the disclosures, um, you, have, you have some significant disclosures in there, but I don't think there are any that are really too um, you know, sensitive um, that are unusual um, in, in accordance with government accounting standards. You have some, you know, some disclosures concerning your fixed assets, some disclosures concerning your debt, um, standard accounting disclosures in there that, that follow the financial statements. But I don't think any of those are really too sensitive. They're pretty straightforward. Um, so we didn't bring any of those to your attention. 
probably a, a disclosure that's going to be significant in the future that may affect the district would be um, a new standard coming out under the uh, government auditing standards considering um, post-retirement benefits as that liability may have to be placed on your financial even though if it's with third party. Um, we're still reviewing that and that implementation isn't for a year or two so um, certainly I'll be discussing that with David when it, when it comes to that point but that could be a significant estimate that comes on to your financial. On the second page is a number of other areas that you can see. Um, difficulties, in, when we, difficulties performing the audit, um, certainly any corrected or uncorrected misstatements when we performed our procedures. If we had any disagreements with management um, and certainly management representations, any other audit findings. If we had any of these issues, we would, again, be able to communicate those directly to the trustees using this letter. That's why it's very important we communicate that every year. Um, we didn't have any of those issues this year. It was actually a fairly smooth audit. Um, and we do uh, extend our appreciation to David and his team uh, to making it a nice, easy, smooth operation. So thank you for that. Any questions on that letter so far? So I'd like to move now to the financial statements. Um, I have a slide here just kind of outlining them. The, the, real, the structure of your financial statements hasn't changed for a number of years since GASB 34 was um, enacted. It's got to be about 10 years ago now, probably a little bit more than that. Um, starts out with our, um, our opinion letter, how we're placing our opinion on the audit. And, again, and this year we've, we've issued an, an unmodified opinion on the audit, um, which is a clean opinion. Um, if we had any issues, it would be qualified, but we've issued a, a clean opinion again this year. Um, also included in, in, in the um, financial statements is the management discussion analysis. This is written by management. This, is, this, this contains summarized financial information, and it provides information to the readers of some of the highlights of financial activity that's happened during the year to the district. Um, that's a required... Um, report that's supposed to be included in your financials. Then the financial statements, statements of net position, which has the assets and liabilities uh, of the of the district. Um, uh, the net position is obviously like the net equity in a in a for-profit organization. The next statement is a statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in net position. This is the revenue and expenses for the year. Um, also, if the financials are in comparative format, so you have both years, so you can compare last year to this year for any unusual changes. Um, after, after, the statement, after that statement is the statement of cash flows, which again removes some of those things like estimates out and just shows your pure cash flows of the district. Um, after that is the notes of the financial statement. Again, this provides, the notes provide a little bit more detail on some of the numbers that are in the statements. Maybe some also some information on maybe non-financial information that are in there. And in the back, there's a schedule of operating expenses. The district has, um, when in the statement of revenue expenses, the expenses are, um, they're grouped by, uh, by functional by functional program, uh, the schedule of operating expenses actually breaks those out to natural categories and how they're allocated over each, each one of those programs. So a lot of good information in the financial statements. It's, it's something that you can definitely sit down at night and read over and over again. They will, they will definitely keep your attention. Uh, the first slide I like to look at is the growth of assets. Um, I have a few years that I put on here. I have four years comparison and I've kind of summarized those and they're found, you know, the, it, it basically summarizes the assets that are found on um, page 
10, I believe, of the financials. Uh, I've, I've summarized them showing cash, investments, their accounts receivable, inventory, and other assets. Um, I didn't include capital assets because that would have thrown the graph off a little bit. So I've included that on a second slide. But this just kind of shows you some, some changes visually instead of looking at the numbers of, of the assets of the district. Um, you can see in 2010, 2011, the district at one time had investments. Um, and although I've classified those, those same amounts in 2012 and 2013 investments, those are really now the, the, the designated funds for, uh, for the district, uh, the, the municipal funds. But in 2010, 2011, they were actually the, the investments were actually combined and, and to become all cash. So that's why that, that had a large, sharp increase in 2011. 2012, they were segregated out again, and you can see the cash dropped right down to basically what is now their operating cash. Um, there's been a slight increase in your inventory. I know that's kind of a little bit difficult to read. It's, a, it's at the bottom. Um, Inventory has been, uh, has been kind of a subject of management to try to capture what is being held by the district in inventory. It's mostly chemicals and, and, and items used to, for emergency repairs. But I think that's been, over the past couple of years, that's been, a, I think, a great asset to management to understand what they're actually holding you know, on hand for inventory. Um, but you're not going to see that fluctuate too much because as, as things are used, they're going to be purchased. So that fluctuation is, is fairly reasonable, again, with the other assets. And, and actually, your accounts receivable, those are going to be fairly consistent from year to year. Um, and I don't expect too much fluctuation, and you don't see that much fluctuation. Understandably, the fluctuation between 2012 and 2013, obviously, is with a rate increase. So you're going to see that that's a reasonable fluctuation to increase on the growth of assets. But there is a good, um, you know, there's an increase in your, in basically your designated cash this year. You had a good um, amount come in for your upgrade fees, the capacity fees, and that's where you're going to see that climb there. Any questions on those? Can you give me an example of investments? Well, before before in 2010, the, the district actually were in, um, you know, uh, United States Treasuries, those type of investments. They were in a fund, I think it was with Key, and then they all they all matured and they all moved actually into a cash account. Now they've all been invested into money market funds, so they're more liquid. They're still earning income, um, but in prior years, in 2010, they were actually in, you know, bonds. So that's that was the change there. Um, so, you know, in 2011, as that transition was happening, it was all just kind of captured, it, you know, happened to be on December in, in, all, in the cash account. Do you know if the district, by statute, has a maximum amount that they can store within their capital reserve balances? I don't know. There is one. No, I don't. I don't think there is. I, I've never been aware of one. Because I know water districts, by PUC regulation, are required to have certain caps on what they can have. But I, I thought sewer districts didn't have a cap. I'm not aware of, of that regulation. No. Any other questions? So the next the next slide is the capital assets, and this this actually gives you a good description of what depreciation does. Um, you're, you're seeing the you know in 2010, you know it's the, when this is just showing from year after year a large decrease. This is what depreciation is the expensing of those assets that have been capitalized. Um, 2010 to 2011, there's a little bit more than normal decrease there, and that was because of a pump, t a pump station was replaced. That was a large, large expense that went through the district at that point. 
But other than that, it's, it's, it's primarily depreciation showing that decrease in assets. Um, this, again, for, for many districts is a reason why you are charging those, those capacity fees because at some point these are going to need to be replaced. And you're going to need to have those funds available at some point in the future to do that. Um, you know, and this is net of any smaller purchases, which is what the districts have been doing for a number of years. They've just been replacing some of the equipment that's been needed. I'd like to ask a couple questions about that. Um, can you talk a little bit? If I believe under GASB 34, instead of using straight line depreciation, uh, you can do alternative method. Um, I don't know if any utilities in the state are doing alternative method for depreciation analysis. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I mean, you can certainly use, it's, it's really management's estimate. There's no statutory, um, you know, setting of life or how it's used. Uh, certainly, uh, water districts are subject to PUC methods, which they have a <coughs> statutory certain number of life years for, you know, pipe or, or structures or, you know, treatment facilities. Um, and, and generally, districts will follow those just because they had to file a PUC report. Um, two districts aren't under that qualification, um, so it, it just kind of basically follows GAP, which is management's estimate of useful life. And certainly what management normally does in, in other districts and in this district is they look at, you know, they look at a broad spectrum of what an estimated useful life of an asset is. Certainly there's IRS, there is, um, you know, there is the PUC, and, you know, there's your own history. How long does a truck last? How long does a computer last? And they use all that information to develop a useful life to depreciate these assets. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, my concern in working with a lot of districts is always that, um, you know, they tend to use some of their uh, depreciation funds to fund operating capital as they're losing um, value in their assets. And um, I just want to make sure that we're holding somewhat of a steady asset value through time so that at some point in the future, and it, you know, could be 20, 30 years down the road, that we're not fully depreciated on a lot of our assets and have essentially no value left in the system. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly uh, the, one of the issues um, with, with uh, generally accepted counting principles is that, you know, your, your fixed assets, first of all, are reported at cost. So as you and I know, that, that generally could be very different from, from really what the value of that asset is. Right. Um, Depreciation is, is just an estimate based on the cost of, of that asset that you paid for in that year that you paid for it, and just trying to expense that over, you know, your best estimate. Now, you certainly, like you said, you could fully depreciate an asset. It's still going to have a value. That's a hard thing to, that's a hard thing to uh, really estimate, um, and that's why you use a number of different, a different uh, you know, items Certainly, with a with a with a governmental entity like a district, you know you're going to see that if some of these fixed assets that are fully depreciated are now valued at a market value, um, disposal of those could result in a gain for the district in that instance. Right. Um, so, you know that's why that's why we leave it up to to management who who basically is involved with these type of assets historically to come up with a useful lives. And, and again, we, we as auditors look at those other pieces of information to make sure that that estimate's reasonable. Um, so, so that management isn't depreciating a building over five years or, or a truck over one year or, you know, that type of thing, or a truck over 20 years for that matter. So I think it's just as long as it's reasonable, that's probably the best you can do. I guess where I'm going with that is just want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're investing enough money in what we're losing in depreciation into capital reserves so that when the next big purchases come up um, that we can start to soften the blow with rates and soften the blow in terms of... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, that's definitely one step you can do is look, 
you know, definitely at your asset classes and how they're being depreciated, um, and certainly take that in consideration when you're putting funds aside when you need to replace them. Um, obviously, the equipment's going to be depreciated quicker as it's going to be used quicker. Um, your structures, treatment facilities, those are going to be depreciated longer with your building. Um, those are that, yeah, that's definitely a consideration. Uh, looking at the liabilities, what I've included here is I've, I've, I did include the current portion of long-term debt um, along with all your other current liabilities uh, just to kind of give you a reference of, you know, basically where, where is your operating, where is your operating revenue going? And it is to your, your current portion of debt. And we're going to see that in a couple of slides later. But the other thing to notice here is that um, really most of your current liabilities are fairly consistent from year to year. Um, you're looking at accrued payroll, accounts payable. Um, you know, it's, it may change a little bit as, as the cutoff at December 31st hits and when, and when items are due and when payroll's owed. Um, those are going to fluctuate a little bit, but really they're fairly consistent from year to year, that, those liabilities. Um, and, and really the biggest, biggest portion that continues um, to be a lot, a, a big draw from your, from your operating revenue is, is really your current portion of debt. Um, so I just wanted to kind of put that out there to show the relationship more on a, on a visual basis. Uh, but a more important slide really is the next slide. Before which you want to know, on this credit uh, growth of liabilities, credits, could you explain that a little bit? Oh, the credits? Some, some of the, uh, your bonds have certain credits that come into play uh, that the main bond bank has enacted. Um, it's basically really to reduce interest, but those credits, excuse me, I mixed that up. Credits are actually um, the financing fees that are being amortized on the bonds when they were originally, originally enacted. So when you finance that bond, you had some fees on the side, you're amortizing those over the life of the bond. So you're going to see those continually go down um, as, as the bond gets paid off. Okay. I was getting confused on the other side of that. But you do have some credits on the revenue side, on the asset side that are... <coughs> That, that come in it seems like credits, we should be getting something, shouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> it's not paying out, but... <laughs> That's not how accounting works. So. You get to pay less. <laughs> like I said, the, mo the more important, this is a great slide that I use for district to current ratio, and it's a, it's a relatively um, a good financial ratio to look at, look at the district, and that is can your current assets really cover your current liabilities? And you're, you're seeing a pretty good um, financial position for the district here, <coughs> where you're basically covering your current liabilities, you know, three times over, more than three times over. Um, so that's a that's actually a good um, financial position, um, considering really the only other long-term debt is your long-term bonds. So you're really covering all of your liabilities right now with your current assets about three times over. That's a good position. Another good slide um, is the net position. And this is good, you know, for readers of the financial to understand is that, you know, you have you 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 have the net position of the of the district and you know it's it's this large number, twenty four million dollars, but really where is all that equity? Well, you can see just in this slide, all of it is in your capital assets. So really, although you, if you look at your financial statement and you're showing, you know, $24.7 million of equity, um, really isn't available to the district. Really, all of that is, is your structures and your buildings and your, and your capital assets. Um, another small portion of that is board designated. Those are those funds that have been set up, those special um, revenue funds that have been set up to, to capture the, uh, the capacity fees and, the, you know, the depreciation to, to put away 
that the, that the board is designating money to put away for future use. And then what's left over is your unrestricted. Um, and, you know, that's just a good, good understanding of, you know, you see those big numbers on the financial, it's just where, uh, where is your net position? Um, and most of it is in your, in your capital assets. And that sort of went back to my question before, is over time we're going to see our net position deteriorate um, unless there's further investment in the capital side of things. Correct. So I, I did put a sli couple slides in um, that kind of go with page 11, um, looking at uh, some revenue trends. Um, really, there isn't, uh, there isn't really any unusual things here. I mean, the rate, the rate increase obviously drove your fees up um, compared to 2012. They've been pretty much steady from 2010 all the way up to 2012. Um, about the same amount of revenue every year. Uh, the rate increase did push that up. Um, the other slide is just showing some other minor revenue sources of the district. Uh, things like your investment return, permits, septic, uh, you know, those type of revenues are going to change. Some of them are fairly consistent. Uh, no real uh, surprises on those. Uh, but I think one of the more important statements for the district is the cash flows. That's something to understand on, on how to read this. Um, I've kind of put some, some numbers in some of the slides here. Really the, the most important piece of that is the bottom of that slide. I, I basically showed, you know, your operating expenses over the past four years, your operating revenue, and, and together what those create is, is basically your cash flows from operations. And um, you can see that that's, that obviously in 2013 jumped with the rate increase, but you know, for the past couple of years, those have been pretty, pretty low, really, from, from that operations point. When you take a look at your cash flow statement in that first top part of that on page 12 of the financials, you see the net operations for 2013, they generated about $890,000 of profit from, from operations. And normally when you look at that, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good profit, but when you look down from what happens with that money going into your investment activities and your and your cash flows, your investing activities generated another 290, but most of that is your capacity upgrade fees. Those get segregated. So really you're not able to utilize that that generation of, of those capacity fees directly in the operating budget. You're now forced to use your operating activities into the financing activities. So where did the where did the eight hundred and ninety thousand dollars go? Well, you, you purchased some fixed assets, you know, capital assets of about thirty eight thousand, and your principal payments and interest for your bonds, uh, it, the total is nine hundred and fifty one thousand dollars. So actually, overall, even though your cash increased by about two hundred twenty nine thousand. Most of that was really a capacity upgrade. You actually used your operating cash to fund operations. So um, that's a good concept to understand because <coughs> currently the trend of, of a lot of districts in the state is to continually, as, as much as possible, try to feather those, those fees annually. And that's, that's really what's happening because costs Costs of operations aren't, aren't going down, and and being able to set aside money to replace the, the depreciation in your fixed assets, and it's it's you're doing. I mean, you're you're doing a great job with your capacity upgrade fees. That's that's exactly what you need to do. Um, but you know, certainly that's something to be aware of. But it's a much better position compared to last year, where you actually had a lot more before the rate increase going out. Um, yep. I could just make a make a comment. Certainly. Um, I, I think as trustees, we understand, and we've made a conscious, we've been consciously aware of 
the fact that we are underfunding our capital reserves uh, to offset depreciation. We had a funded depreciation reserve um, that we have consciously reduced and tapped uh, as a method to try to control rates and avoid rate increases. But it's a it's a it's a strategy that the trustees agreed upon um, with the intent of refunding that reserve uh, beginning in 2018 when one of our two major uh, debt instruments is retired. And I think I've spoken on this repeatedly that we need, we need to be sure that when the time comes uh, that the board has the historical memory and the, and the fortitude to take those funds and begin to reinvest those in the debt retirement reserve so that we are in fact capitalizing, um, reinvesting uh, in reserve, establishing that reserve again, uh, which we depleted to do the replacement of pump station four, um, to upgrade the, the gravity sewer line in Black Point Road, so we, we have spent significant capital to upgrade our deteriorating system. Um, and I would expect that uh, with a rebound in the economy that our um, user rates will start to climb again. But the big, the big nut that we had to crack uh, was getting through to 2018 um, and then commit ourselves to repay ourselves what we've borrowed from that fund. So that's a conscious strategy that we haven't talked about a lot since we've done it, but it was a, it was a conscious decision that we made, and, uh, and I'm going to fully expect that beginning in 2018 that the board would then set those funds uh, aside, recommit them back in, and, and deposit them back into our funded depreciation reserve so we get balance there. We also need to keep in mind that we don't pay cash for everything, so when it becomes time to replace some of these assets, we're going to likely issue new debt and, uh, and fund it out over the lifespan of, of the new assets that we're investing in. We don't have to pay cash um, for everything. We Obviously, the system wasn't built with a cash payment. It was built with... Uh, um, credit instruments that were, were issued, so uh, that's that's going to be part of whatever long-term strategy future trustees have um, to deal with. So, just wanted to throw those comments in because I think, in a sense, um, what I am taking from some of your comments is a bit of a warning, and uh, and we haven't gotten to this place by accident. We are we're aware of how we got here, and I would expect at some point. Um, that we might ask the superintendent to work with our accountant on, you know, a strategy for what would be the right balance of capital reserves to build versus, um, um, you know, borrowing that we would anticipate as the needs to replace some of these assets start to materialize. So, Charlie, there was, there was one term you used, use the rates increasing, but. The user rates won't increase. The user fees will increase because we'll have more users. But the rates correct. Uh, yeah. What I'm saying is the revenues yeah. from user fees will increase because there'll be more utilization of the sewer sewer system. Yeah. Uh, I'm not talking about rate increases again. Although we did hear a lot of testimony from folks who indicated they would rather see consistent rate increases at the one to two to three percent per year level as opposed to you know, a, a eight or ten percent jump every decade. Uh, frankly, um, I think if we can come up with a strategy that minimizes the increases, it'll be better for the overall um, economic climate in the community. Because certainly that's one of the factors that folks think about when they're locating businesses and industries in the community is what the utility costs are. And I think we should strive to keep those favorable. But that'll be individual decisions that the trustees make as the need arises. Yeah. yeah, I just want to add, that's a great point that you mentioned there about user fees, because I don't think a lot of folks truly understand that most of the costs are associated with fixed assets. And whenever new users come on, those fixed assets are already somewhat paid for. So the revenue that's coming in 
um, really helps uh, the existing users that are in the system. So, because the fixed fees have already been somewhat paid for. Um, so, you know, we're very lucky position to have growth in the system. Some other areas of the states are not so fortunate as, as you've probably worked with a lot. So, and I think we're in a great position in terms of just looking at our size of a utility, how much money we have in uh, accumulated assets. Um, maybe you could comment on that. Some of the other districts that you work with that are our size that may have older infrastructure, you know, probably have a lot less asset base to work with. Yeah, most most districts that I've been working with, they're they've got a little bit less on the, on that side. They're more on the the ten year plan where they're doing something every year with their with their structure. Um, that's that's basically what I see a lot as a trend from districts is to, you know, not not tackle the whole thing at once, but um, do more of a study over the over the system and and accomplish some over a 10-year plan. Sometimes that plan changes when someone wants to dig into the to, to the area and have to move your system, and then suddenly maybe your plan changes a little bit to, to you know accommodate that. Um, but for the most part, that's that's generally what I see is is that happening. And because that 10-year plan and because the investment in infrastructure on an annual basis. I think that's where more of the the, the slight jumps in, in, in rates are, are now happening. Because that's kind of how um, it's kind of how it's happening in, out there in the districts. Um, but certainly that's a, that's a that's a great point. Um, a couple of years ago, you did replace a whole pump station, and you know there was no financing involved with that. And that's a, you know that's definitely a benefit to the user. Um, you know, with with no rate hike, and you know, that's certainly something to consider. Any other questions? Well, thank you again for inviting me tonight. Um, I appreciate it. It's been a been a long time auditing, and finally, again, like I said, I got to see some faces connected to the names on the minutes, um, and I appreciate you having me here. I do have one other question. Oh, sorry, Go ahead. Um, you still include management letters in your audit reports when it's necessary, I assume. Well, actually, that standard has changed, <laughs> but yes, to answer your question directly, yes. What 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 they've generally changed it to is if there is a if there's a significant deficiency or a material weakness, one of the more severe type deficiencies in internal control, we will issue a separate letter. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a suggestion, a recommendation to improve controls, maybe something we're seeing, maybe a suggestion to refinance or something like that, it would be included right in your trustee letter mm -hmm. if we had that. Okay. Um, Thank you. I just I just want to take note of the fact that you know there there were no significant deficiencies noted in the report. I think that's a credit to um, our staff and, and I just, I guess, out of the discussion, uh, wanted to um, make it clear, I guess, to yep. folks who've been listening who may not exactly follow how this discussion has gone, that uh, one of the conclusions is that we don't have any misrepresentations and, and major financial issues that Nope. You're I mean, pointing your finger at. Like I said, part of the audit is we review internal controls, and for a small office, um, obviously one of the concerns for for good good internal controls is segregation of duties. Um, and for a small office, um, the district has has good segregation of duties, where where they have one individual that has to uh, or has duties to do a number of things in a transaction cycle. Is always monitoring and review of that. So um, there are mitigating controls in place to to um, you know oversee those type of activities. So earlier you mentioned something about uh, carried over benefits for retired uh, members. I I'm not really sure that applies here. It may not. I, again, it's something I have to look into. It's a standard that's coming up. I just like have we already had that for we had this. At least state them, not not necessarily 
fully fund them, but I don't think yeah. we, we have an issue with that. It's, well, yeah, I mean, certain districts it's going to affect and certain districts it's not. Um, like I said, I have to I have to look at what there is out there for the retirement plan. Like, it really hasn't been a standard in the past, so it hasn't been a... So it was just a general statement you made, not... Just a general okay. statement. Um, I think it, I think when you look at financials, say for you know Scarborough or you know the city of Portland, um, you're going to see a lot of changes in some of those, and it's it's and there are a lot of districts where it does affect it, but it depends on the plan. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the thing I have to look at. All right. Before we move on, just uh, want to thank you very much, Mike, for coming in and spending the time. It was very informative and uh, very much appreciate you coming. Thank you. All right. <coughs> and with that, I guess I would entertain a motion for approval of the annual audit. And annual report. Or annual report, I'm sorry. Annual audit and annual report. I move that the, the district approve the uh, audit report and the uh, annual report um, issued by the superintendent and that those uh, constitute the 2013 annual report of the Scarborough Sanitary District. Second. A motion and a second. Any additional questions or comments? I think you should come back again next year. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take that into advisement. Thank you, Ben. Any other questions? All in favor of approval? I'm opposed. All right. Moving on. Still under new business. I'll entertain a motion that we recess to executive session per Title I, Section 405 MRSA, to consult with the district's attorney with regard to a legal matter. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? And we will recess and be back with you shortly. Thank you very much.